and good morning, everybody. Uh, today we have a very special talk, which is not directly medical, but related to it. The speaker is Dr. A.J. Reisinger, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Soil and Water Quality at IFAS. He will be speaking to us today on our water on drugs effects of pharmaceuticals on aquatic ecosystems. Dr. Reisinger, as I mentioned, is an assistant professor here at IFAS, and his research focuses on nitrogen and phosphorus cycling, as well as the effect of pharmaceuticals and personal care products in our aquatic uh, ecosystems. He received his bachelor's from Notre Dame in environmental sciences, and then MS and PhD, uh, MS from Kansas State and PhD from Notre Dame in biology. His current work and past work has been supported by local funds such as the Alachua County Environmental Protection Department, state funds from the Florida Nursery Growers and Landscapers Association, and federal funds from NSF and NOAA. In addition to all this extension work, he's also mentoring four PhD students and has supervised multiple undergraduate honors thesis projects, training the next generation of our scientists. So Dr. Reisinger, it's all yours. Thanks a lot for that introduction, Pushpa, and for the invitation. This is really exciting for me. Um, it sounds like this is maybe gonna be a little bit different than your usual presentations because we won't be talking much about medical research or uh, uh, medical studies, but we'll be talking a little bit about how certain uh, prescription drugs might be having effects on some of the environmental work that I work on. But like Pushpa said, my name is A.J. Reisinger, Alexander J. Reisinger officially, um, and I'm an assistant professor in the Soil and Water Sciences Department here at IFAS. I started here in August of 2017. So this is the start of my fifth year of my, of my program. So I'm now at the point where I kind of have figured out what the heck's going on in IFAS and uh, how, to, how to run my program and how to do my work, but I'm still, still learning every day. Um, and so my work overall here at UF focuses a lot on how activities on the urban landscape affect downstream water quality. So I do work looking at how residential landscape management affects nutrient runoff and nutrient exports to the aquifer or to downstream lakes and wetlands. I do work looking at stream restoration and stormwater pond management um, and how that affects downstream nutrient and pollutant export. And then kind of one thing that's a little more close to my heart is the work that I do looking at pharmaceuticals and personal care products and how they affect aquatic ecosystem functioning. So that's what I'm going to be talking to you about here today. Uh, the title of this presentation is Our Water on Drugs, Effects of Pharmaceuticals on Aquatic Ecosystems. Um, and before I get into the actual presentation, I want to start with a whole suite of acknowledgments here. Um, so this work is, I started getting interested in pharmaceuticals as a postdoctoral researcher at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Dr. Emma Rosie, who's highlighted here in yellow, she was my postdoc advisor, and she's kind of <clears throat> at the forefront of understanding the eco-toxicological effects of pharmaceuticals. Um, and so that's where I started this work, and a lot of what I'm going to present today is uh, work from her and her collaborators as well. Um, I'd also like to thank the other collaborators, both from here at UF as well as across the country. Um, I'd like to thank funding sources that includes National Science Foundation, Australian Research Council, and then some private uh, donors as well. And then all of the undergraduate, high school, and graduate students that have really contributed to all this work. So when I give a presentation like this, I'd like to start with uh, this quote from Rachel Carson in Silent Spring. So for those of you that aren't aware, Silent Spring is the book that Rachel Carson wrote that kind of um, was the catalyst for the environmentalist, environmentalism movement. And it was focused a lot on DDT and what that did to bird shell, bird egg shells. Um, but this quote is, is more general and more broad and definitely still applicable today. The quote reads, the chemicals to which life is asked to make its adjustment are no longer merely the calcium and silica and copper 
and all of the rest of the minerals washed out of the rocks and carried in rivers to the sea. They are the synthetic creations of man's inventive mind, brewed in his laboratories and having no counterparts in nature. So that was the quote was referencing primarily a pesticide that was used, uh, used pretty heavily um, in the 1950s and 60s. But that quote is as ap applicable today as it was in 1962. And we can think about those synthetic chemicals that are brewed in man's laboratories um, by looking at the uh, ubiquity of synthetic chemicals in the uh, global environment. So this is a figure, sorry, it's a little blurry, but this is a figure from a review or synthesis paper published about four years ago that was looking at synthetic chemicals as an agent of global change. So this figure here on the left in black and white shows the proportional change of some of the primary global environmental issues, um, how much they've changed relative to 1970. So nitrogen fertilizer has fertilizer use has increased by 300% since 1970. The world population has doubled since 1970. CO2 is going up, biodiversity is going down. So these are some of the main recognized drivers of global environmental issues. We can uh, overlay that with uh, the relative change in synthetic chemical production and use since 1970. And we see that these synthetic chemicals are being produced in, and increasing in prevalence at rates as high or higher than any of the other um, already recognized agents of global change. So global pesticides that have been produced are a 300% increase. Uh, the number of approved pharmaceuticals in the US is a 200% increase. The uh, chemical industry output for emerging economies is a 500 fold increase. Um, global pharmaceutical consumption has increased by about 400%. So this is showing that the use and prevalence of these pharmaceuticals and other synthetic chemicals like pesticides um, and other uh, chemicals we use in our daily lives is increasing really rapidly with um, unfore unforetold or unknown consequences in the environment. <clears throat> so those of you that were uh, around and paying attention to the public discourse back in the 1990s are probably aware of this um, ad campaign, This Is Your Brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. And the tagline was, any questions? This was a really kind of really common um, and prevalent uh, anti-drug campaign uh, that was really popular and also um, really like just wi widely known. And I like to think of it from a different perspective. So I'm an aquatic ecosystem ecologist. I study streams and lakes and wetlands and rivers. So I say, this is your urban stream. This is actually a stream that runs um, down uh, southwest or down 13th Ave. So this is this construction here on the left is now a condominium complex. Across the street is the Days Inn, and 441 is right over here. This is a concrete line channel that runs into Bivens Arm. This is your urban stream on drugs. So you you might be able to tell there's nothing visually different. It's the exact same picture because we can't see these drugs in the environment. We often can't even measure them because they're at such low concentrations. And so for that reason, they've, uh, they've really been ignored up until the last uh, five to 10 years in their environmental impacts. Even though we can't see them, we know that pharmaceuticals uh, and personal care products are a part of our ecosystems. There are a wide range of classes of these pharmaceuticals, personal care products. I don't have to tell you all of these, but think about what you might use in your daily life. Antibiotics, antihistamines, antidepressants, painkillers, anticonvulsants, anti I'm not going to read through all of these, but also you've got to think about some of the, the personal care products we use in our daily lives. Bug spray, sunscreen, detergents, cosmetics, illicit drugs. All of these things are synthetic chemicals that can potentially make their way into our aquatic environments. Uh, to give you an idea of the prevalence of uh, some of these medications and other products, uh, more than 15 years ago, there were 3.5 billion prescriptions year filled in the United States. And so that's 12 prescriptions filled per person per year. So that's, that's a pretty, pretty big number. And I, I would assume that those numbers have just increased since 2004. And as of, I believe this was as of 2015, the uh, pharmaceutical and personal care product industry was evaluated economically at about $1 trillion with about 50% of that total economic income coming from the US. So this is all to say that 
uh, drugs, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, they're all big, it's a big business. Um, they are very beneficial. They've improved our quality of life, but they've also made a lot of people a lot of money. So they're probably not going anywhere. And that, that's a good thing overall, but we need to figure out how we can maybe reduce their impacts on the environment as well. So how do pharmaceuticals enter our waterways? Well, there's a variety of different ways this can happen. This is a diagram from a paper that we just published a couple of months ago, actually, where we looked at all the different routes that uh, pharmaceuticals can get into streams in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And so when you flush your toilet, um, the toilet drains into your wastewater line. And in a perfect world with a sewer line and a wastewater treatment plant, that uh, sewer line drains to your wastewater treatment plant. That wastewater treatment plant is designed to uh, disinfect and remove any human pathogens from wastewater. Sometimes they're designed for nutrient removal as well. They aren't designed to remove synthetic chemicals. That doesn't mean they don't remove them, but that's not their primary purpose. So some synthetic chemicals can be discharged directly from wastewater treatment plants. But we also know that this isn't a perfect world. Uh, infrastructure is failing all across the country, and so there are leaks in our infrastructure. And so these leaks and overflows from sewage infrastructure can be exported uh, into other ways. So if you look at this uh, mass balance, the drugs that you take into your body, some proportion of that is going to be broken down by your body and actually used for the intended purpose. But some proportion of that is going to be excreted directly into your sewage. So like I said, a lot of that is transported to wastewater. Um, some of that is retained by wastewater and some is diverted to receiving waters. But we also have these leaks, this leaky pipeline that can discharge these drugs and other synthetic chemicals directly into uh, downstream receiving waters. And this is not even to say uh, anything about areas that have septic systems instead of sewer lines. Septic systems are even more not designed to uh, remove synthetic chemicals, so they also can be a source of uh, drugs. So all the different places where drugs can make their way into our water bodies, we, they can start with manufacturing facilities. Whenever you are making a pharmaceutical, you have to clean your equipment. That uh, lines, those lines have to be uh, discharged somewhere. And work from New York shows that streams in New York that have pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities have much higher concentrations of pharmaceuticals and personal care products. So on the left here, these are uh, samples taken from places without a hospital versus with a hospital in their watershed. You can see the hospitals aren't really a main uh, discharge point. That's largely because their discharge gets drained to a wastewater treatment plant. Um, but, but even the hospitals themselves, sorry, this is actually from wastewater treatment plants with hospitals uh, discharging to them. But then if they have wastewater treatment plants that receive water from manufacturers, you get uh, two, three, four orders of magnitude. So hundreds to tens of thousands of times higher concentrations than places with hospitals or no hospitals in the watershed. We also know that if we go to places with really concentrated uh, production of pharmaceuticals, like in Hyderabad, India, which is a hot spot for pharmaceutical manufacturing, you get really high concentrations. So this is a river in Hyderabad that receives direct discharge. They don't have the same wastewater treatment plant uh, requirements. So it receives direct discharge from more than 90 pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities. And if you took a sample of water from that river, you get a concentration of ciprofloxacin, which is a very strong antibiotic. Concentration in the water is 32 milligrams of cipro per liter. A typical dose of Cipro is 250 to 750 milligrams for an average human. And so if you drink a liter of water from this reservoir, you would be getting about an eighth of a dose of Cipro. So that's a really high concentration. Um, that's, that's kind of crazy high, honestly. So we also know when we take, so once the drugs are manufactured, they're uh, prescribed to us for improving our daily lives, improving our health, improving our longevity. We know that metabolism varies by compound and by individual, but regardless, nobody is 100% efficient with their uh, use and uh, metabolism of uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, Non-prescription drugs and personal care products also can be taken um, at higher rates, at higher doses than might be prescribed by a doctor. Uh, some people might take uh, more over-the-counter medications than they really need, and so that's another source for our water bodies. 
once we use these pharmaceuticals and metabolize them, um, they become our human waste, right? And so they can either be liquid effluent or biosolids. Um, from the wastewater treatment plant, liquid effluent is going to be discharged directly into um, a receiving water. It could be a stream, it could be a river, it could be the ocean, it could be a lake, it could be uh, direct discharge into groundwater. Um, but whatever is uh, still dissolved in the water will make its way out with that effluent. But we also have some pharmaceuticals that are uh, hydrophilic, so they don't stay dissolved. They prefer to uh, settle out in the solid material of our wastes. And about 50% of US biosolids are land applied. Those uh, land applied biosolids have to be treated for pathogens, but they don't have to be treated for uh, synthetic chemicals like pharmaceuticals. And then finally, like I mentioned earlier, septic tanks are kind of like little mini wastewater treatment plants, but they're not designed for synthetic chemical removal. And that's if you actually use all of your medication. If you don't use your medication, um, then you might be tempted to throw your uh, pharmaceuticals, throw your drugs out in your trash. Um, disposal of unused pharmaceuticals in U.S. landfills ranges from about 1,400 to 8,500 tons per year. So that's another pretty large uh, mechanism or pathway that these drugs get into the environment. If you look at the pharmaceutical concentrations of uh, pharmaceutical concentrations in biosolids, this is the concentration of a wide range of different pharmaceuticals and personal care products. So this dashed line represents parts per million. Um, parts per billion is below here. Um, the overall units here are micrograms per kilogram of dry weight. So all of these orange arrows, these are all antibiotics that are found in uh, biosolids. These are some antihistamines, so diphenhydramine. This is Benadryl, the active ingredient in Benadryl. This is an antidepressant, fluoxetine. This is Prozac. This is triclosan. It's an antimicrobial that's actually been outlawed since the study was performed. Um, it's banned in over-the-counter uh, products anymore. And then we have caffeine, a common personal care product that we all know and love, and I have a big mug up right here. This is mostly from discarding unwanted caffeine, unwanted coffee grounds, or used coffee grounds, that sort of thing. We also know that infrastructure is failing in the United States, like I mentioned earlier. So even if you flush everything down the toilet and you hope that it gets treated by the wastewater treatment plant, uh, that's not necessarily the case. Every day, 32 billion gallons of wastewater flows through 700,000 miles of underground pipes in the United States. We know that 900 billion gallons of sewage is released into the nation's rivers and streams each year. And the American Society of Civil Engineers recently gave the US sewage infrastructure a grade of D plus. So we're not necessarily failing, but um, I wouldn't say a D plus grade is something to write home about by any means. Uh, it was also estimated by the Society of Civil Engineers that about $150 billion is needed to upgrade the sewage system of this country. And we're doing better than a lot of other countries across the world that don't have as uh, high of wastewater treatment standards. It's not all because of us uh, excreting uh, things out of our own home. We also know that there's a lot of drugs that used in agriculture. Over half of the antibiotics used in this country are used for livestock, like in um, high density confined animal feeding operations or for, for poultry or for cattle. There's links between antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance in the environment. So as we continue to discharge these into the environment, antibiotic resistance becomes more prevalent in the environment and that can limit the efficacy of antibiotics and other prescription drugs for uh, medicinal or therapeutic purposes. So this is another summary. Wastes contribute to uh, pharmaceuticals in the environment from animals as well. And actually more than half of the hogs and chickens in the US are raised in large facilities that really necessitate these antibiotics. So what? So those are all the pathways, but um, who cares? Why does that matter? So this is another figure from that paper that we just published a couple months ago. Here, we're looking at the total mean, the mean pharmaceutical concentration from six, oh no, seven streams. We sampled these streams weekly over a year and collected pharmaceuticals uh, of a variety of different therapeutic classes. So moving from left to right, these streams are increasing in population density of the watershed. So you can see that more people means more pharmaceuticals. 
But I should also note there are no direct wastewater discharges in these streams. So these are all actually coming from either direct inputs or failing uh, infrastructure, which is our, our main uh, expectation. Across the entire country, this is a, this is a table of uh, all of the chemical, uh, pharmaceutical and other synthetic chemical compounds that have been found by the USGS in a survey of the nation's streams uh, published back about 20 years ago. So don't, don't read all of, these, uh, all of these different rows of the table, but I'm just pointing out that the maximum concentration you're seeing here is in micrograms per liter. So that's uh, parts per billion. So those are really low concentrations. They're well below toxicity thresholds established by EPA and other ecotoxicologists. So it's often been thought that, okay, we know that drugs are out there, but they're so low that we don't really care. But recently, or maybe not that recently, about five years ago, we published a conceptual paper showing that um, with increasing concentrations, you do get increasing toxicity, but typically what we find in the environment is well below the toxicity threshold. So synthetic chemicals in the environment aren't usually, or at least synthetic pharmaceuticals, aren't usually at the level that they're going to kill anything in the environment. They're not going to kill algae. They're not going to kill fish. They're not going to kill bugs. But the threshold that we need to reach to change the ecological functioning of these aquatic communities is much lower. And we see ecological disruption of our natural aquatic ecosystems at concentrations that we detect in the environment. So the rest of this talk is going to be talking a little bit about this ecological disruption that we've seen from pharmaceuticals and personal care products in our streams and rivers and lakes and ponds. So why do we care about any of this? Well, um, some recent work that's been published, uh, including a paper that looked at how uh, trout uh, respond to methamphetamines, they found that trout gets addicted to methamphetamines at fairly low concentrations, and that changes their behavior and their feeding rates. And also, there's just kind of some moral imperative that we probably shouldn't get our, our trout and other wildlife hooked on illicit drugs. I think that's a, a kind of a fair thing that we can say. We also, um, myself and some other colleagues, just published a paper that showed that if you expose uh, crayfish to a common antidepressant, ciprofo or not ciprofloxacin, uh, citalopram, sorry, citalopram, um, that those crayfish become bolder, increase their activity, and increase their feeding rates that, all, that also enhances their risk of predation and can change their ecosystem effects as well. So what do drugs do in our rivers? This is a picture of the Hudson River uh, that was like right outside my office when I was a postdoc just starting this work. These are all the compounds that we found in the Hudson River. So you can see that there's a wide range. There's acetaminophen, there's caffeine, there's cocaine, there's uh, nicotine, morphine, um, trimethoprim, a, a wide range of different compounds that have been found in rivers. And it's important to consider that these, are, these drugs, these chemicals, are what our aquatic food webs are being exposed to. So this is a, a pretty, or a pretty uh, classic diagram of aquatic ecosystem food webs, where at the base of the food webs, you have algae or leaves. These algae or leaves are then fed upon by bugs, stream invertebrates. These stream invertebrates can be fed upon by fish or they can emerge as adults where they start flying and then they get fed upon by uh, birds, bats, spiders, lizards. Um, and then things also fall into the aquatic ecosystem, terrestrial invertebrates, leaves, that sort of thing. So this, uh, this diagram is called the tangled webs diagram showing how interconnected aquatic and terrestrial and aerial food webs can be. And so our question is what do these pharmaceuticals do to these aquatic food webs? So I'm gonna start by talking about algae and then I'll kind of move up the, the food web a little bit. And so algae on drugs, this uh, is some work that I did with an undergraduate student, Morgan Gallagher. This was actually the first, uh, first paper that I published from my Florida work. We found that um, pharmaceuticals and personal care products in this study, we found that um, this was ciprofloxacin. We found that ciprofloxacin greatly diminished or completely inhibited gross primary production. So on the y-axis of this figure, you're looking at the response ratio of algal primary production or photosynthesis is how you can think of this. A value of one means that the uh, algae that was exposed to ciprofloxacin 
exhibited the same photosynthetic rates as control, the control algae that was not exposed. So anything below one shows that the exposed algae were less efficient at photosynthesizing. Anything above one would mean that they would be actually stimulated. Um, and these are four different sites along an urbanization gradient of Sweetwater Branch here in Gainesville. So the headwaters um, is up in the Duck Pond neighborhood. The urban stream is um, right in downtown Main Street, Gainesville. Wastewater treatment plant, this is below the wastewater treatment plant facility in, uh, on Main Street. And then the wetland, this is just above the Sweetwater Wetlands Preserve. So you can see that all of the values are below one. And actually at one site, our wastewater treatment plant site, gross primary production was completely inhibited. There was no photosynthesis occurring, even though there was a lot of algae that had actually grown on there, they just weren't functioning very well. There's also been studies that have shown that uh, all, all of these different pharmaceuticals and personal care product, products, sorry, have been shown to suppress algae, triclosan, diphenhydramine, stimulants like caffeine, antidepressants like fluoxetine, fluoxetine and antibiotics. Bacteria are the other side of the base of the aquatic food web. They're the kind of um, decomposition side. And we've shown in the lab, we, so this is not work that I've been involved in, but collaborators and, and colleagues have shown that in the lab, triclosan, which is that antimicrobial that's now uh, banned from over-the-counter products, but triclosan resistance develops rapidly in uh, artificial stream experiments and the bacterial community composition is changed. So this is triclosan resistance in an artificial stream experiment. Um, control stream bacteria, you see there's only one bar that's like slightly showing a little bit of resistance, but within a week you start to develop triclosan resistance if uh, the artificial stream community is exposed to triclosan. In the field, we also show that triclosan concentration increases with proximity to a wastewater treatment plant. So this is, and then the triclosan resistance increases with concentration. So more concentration of triclosan in your sediments, more resistant bacteria. So I think this is pretty well established now. If you continue to expose bacteria to an antibiotic or an antimicrobial, you are really kind of just uh, priming antibiotic or antimicrobial resistance. We've also found that uh, respiration, which is the basically the breathing of these bacteria, is affected by pharmaceuticals and personal care products. So respiration here is on the y-axis. Um, the control, this is a bacterial community that was not exposed to any pharmaceuticals. And then these are all of the other treatments that we expose these bacteria to. And you can see that not all of the exposures had a negative or inhibitory effect, but many of them did. But we also know that environmental context is key. So again, sorry that I'm showing you so many graphs. Hopefully you're keeping up with me on this. But um, prior exposure to pharmaceuticals has been shown to lead to no effect or positive responses. So this figure isn't well labeled, but again, we're looking at that response ratio metric. So a value of one means that the treatment is the same as the control. A value above one means that there's actually an increase in, re in the response. And here we're looking at, um, this is actually bacterial respiration and the four bars represent bacteria from four different sites moving from least urbanized to most urban urbanized in the Chesapeake Bay region. And you can see that in this column B, this is actually ciprofloxacin and antibiotic. And you can see that as you get more and more urbanized, the response ratio increases to the point where the most urban site actually showed a, a positive or stimulatory effect of respiration following that uh, Cipro addition. And that tells us that this bacterial community is actually using Cipro as an energy source. They're feeding on it instead of being negatively inhibited by it. We've also seen community composition change. So if you go in and you actually sequence the microbes, the, the bacterial community that's in there, you get really dramatic shifts that, aren't, that are due to these drugs. They aren't due to the other environmental factors. So if we look at what these algae and bacteria do um, in the streams when they're, when they're exposed to these pharmaceuticals, we do a lot of uh, artificial stream experiments because we're not really allowed to just dump a lot of drugs into a real stream or a real wetland. So we do a lot of lab-based artificial trials. This is a, an overhead view of one of our artificial streams where you have these paddle wheels that are uh, basically 
constantly moving water in this raceway um, track, this oval raceway, and you have natural substrates of rocks and sand and, and leaves and other organic sources at the bottom of the stream. Um, and so we do this to allow us to um, replicate a real world environment, but it gives us a lot more control on the chemical exposure and chemical conditions of the stream. So in one study that we're still working on publishing, we mimicked the uh, stream water of Baltimore, so the nutrient concentrations, the carbon concentrations, as well as the pharmaceutical concentrations. What we found is that in streams that did not receive drugs, so these are these controls, they had about a three time, threefold increase in nutrient demand or nutrient uptake, as opposed to streams that did receive a pharmaceutical treatment. And so one thing that streams do really well for us is actually taking up a lot of the nitrogen and phosphorus that gets into them through fertilizer and other pathways, protecting downstream water quality. So by exposing these stream communities to drugs, we're reducing their ability to uh, protect or buffer downstream water quality. We also found that more stressed streams that received a higher amount of these urban stressors were not as affected by the pharmaceuticals and personal care products. We hypothesize that this is suggesting a tougher microbial community, but the group of uh, collaborators on this project aren't really microbial ecologists. So this is kind of a little bit of a, a hand wavy shot in the dark uh, type of answer for that. So that's what uh, algae and bacteria do uh, in response to drugs. But what do drugs do to bugs, to invertebrates in streams and rivers? Bugs on drugs. So this is another artificial stream study where we looked at the response of amphipods to tagamet. So tagamet is an antihistamine that prevents the secretion of stomach acid. So it's really an antacid, but its uh, mode of action is antihistamine or a histamine antagonist. It was first approved in 1977 and was the first drug to reach more than $1 billion in sales per year. So it's a really prevalent and long, um, long known, long, long used uh, antihistamine and antacid. But invertebrates use histamines as neurotransmitters. So histamine antagonists could have some effect on invertebrate behavior and invertebrate functioning. And so for the study that was performed by colleagues of mine, they looked at the effect of different concentrations of smetodyne, this histamine antagonist, on amphipod population growth and population production. Concentrations detected in the US rivers, which is this 0 0.7 micrograms per liter or um, 0 0.7 parts per billion, so crazy low numbers, right? You found a significant reduction in the number of individual amphipods in the stream study. So that shows us not that the amphipods were dying because this was actually a three month long study long enough to allow for multiple generations of this amphipod. We didn't see that they were dying. We found that they were reproducing less. So ha that has significant population growth dynamics and potential effects on uh, broader ecosystem functioning. We've also looked at how antidepressants affect invertebrate responses, um, such as looking at the response of caddisflies. Caddisflies are really sensitive to pollution, um, and they are, uh, as, as juveniles, they build cases and they filter particles out of the water, and then they emerge as winged adults. And so we measured the size of these caddisflies as well as their emergence rates, so how rapidly they, they grew into adulthood and left the, the stream ecosystem. And what we found is that particularly in this low concentration um, exposure of 20 nanograms per liter, um, we found that these caddisflies emerged more rapidly. They, they were trying to get away from this uh, stressful environment. At the higher concentration, they didn't seem to respond. So we think that this is um, signifying that at low concentrations, maybe something in their, their cellular biology isn't recognizing the stressor and it's somehow entering the system more easily. But again, this is more of a hypothetical thing. We're not exactly sure why we see this uh, significant increase in emergence at low concentration, but not at the higher concentration. So uh, moving on to fish. So fish, I think, are what non-aquatic ecologists think about the most when they think about aquatic ecology, right? Um, fish are the more charismatic freshwater organisms. 
Um, and so we've done work looking at fish and other aquatic organisms and their response to drugs. So this is a figure from a paper by one of my Australian colleagues, Erin Richman, and she did a study looking at how, how much of different uh, therapeutic classes do brook trout or platypi, platypuses, consume on a daily basis. So they chose platypuses because A, they're from Australia, but B, both platypuses and brook trout are almost exclusively, uh, almost exclusively feed on aquatic invertebrates and so, or algae. And so we can figure out how much or what concentration of different pharmaceuticals do these uh, food resources have in their bodies and then use some environmental models to, to estimate how much of these different classes are these organisms consuming on a daily basis. What we found was that on a daily basis, a platypus consumes about 60% of a human daily dose after scaling for body size um, of antidepressants. Trout are a little lower, about 30%, but still, these uh, aquatic organisms are being exposed to really high concentrations um, just on their day, in their daily lives. We've also found in a paper that was recently published um, that I think was initially what got uh, pushed by interest in me coming to give a talk, we found that crayfish exposed to SSRIs, uh, uh, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, antidepressants, um, when they're exposed to these antidepressants, they become hungrier and more active. So in another artificial stream study, we uh, had crayfish in half of the streams and exposed another half of those crayfish to an SSRI um, at a very low environmentally realistic concentration. And we found that their uh, time spent in a food section of a behavioral trial was significantly higher. We also found that they were significantly more active, moving around a lot more in these behavioral trials. And so the potential for these uh, behavioral responses can really scale up a lot because we talked about those, um, those tangled webs. And if you change one thing about the feeding rate of a crayfish or of a fish, that can have really big carryover effects on like the algae or on the birds or the spiders that might be feeding on the bugs. So last but not least, what do drugs do in rivers? Well, we know that uh, effects can extend beyond the water. Emerging insects that I talked about earlier, they uh, might be emerging more quickly if they're exposed to pharmaceuticals. And they're also a major source of food for many terrestrial predators. So we collected uh, concentrations of uh, aquatic invertebrates that had emerged from aquatic ecosystems in Australia. Moving from left to right, we're looking at a human development uh, gradient. Um, and we see that um, some invertebrates can have really high concentrations. These figures are showing the overall distribution of all of the invertebrates that we collected from these sites. Note the logarithmic scale of pharmaceutical concentration in nanograms per gram. We also then collected riparian spiders that feed on aquatic insects um, and measured the pharmaceutical concentration of these spiders. So again, you can see that there is this kind of gradient, this decreasing concentration as you move along the human land use gradient. But at the most impacted, and even at some of the other fairly impacted sites, you get pretty high concentrations. So 100,000 nanograms per gram is, even if you're like me and think about this a lot, that's still not an intuitive number for me, but that's actually 1%. So 1% of this spider's total biomass was made up for made up of pharmaceuticals, a wide range of classes, but 1% of the total biomass of that, those spiders was a drug, was a synthetic chemical. That's crazy to me. 1% doesn't seem like a lot until you think about the really low concentrations that seem to be in the environment. So we still need to figure out how all these things come together, but we do know that there's a wide range of potential uh, environmental impacts of pharmaceuticals in the environment. We know that they can affect mortality and growth rates of certain uh, stream invertebrates, behavioral modifications of crayfish, community structure of bacteria. We know that pharmaceuticals move through food webs. They affect ecosystem functions like photosynthesis or nutrient removal, and they can affect biogeochemical transformations uh, influencing downstream water quality. So you might be sitting here wondering, well, aren't pharmaceuticals regulated? Uh, shouldn't their environmental discharge be controlled by somebody? 
Well, here in the United States, the EPA regulates the release of sewage. The EPA is who decides what can and can't be uh, discharged into the environment. Um, the release of sewage is regulated, but that's not based on pharmaceuticals and personal care products. There is no treatment requirement or treatment threshold for these synthetic chemicals. Uh, also, pharmaceuticals and personal care products are not listed aquatic contaminants. Again, that gets back to the fact that they're typically in such low concentrations that they're assumed to not have an effect because they don't usually kill things. But all of our work is showing that they do have substantial ecosystem effects. The Food and Drug Administration regulates the safety of drugs, so they make sure that they're safe for human consumption, but they don't care about the environmental consequences. So overall, um, I would say that the effects of pharmaceuticals on the environment are not well understood, but we're getting there every year. Every year, more published studies come out, and people are starting to recognize that it's important to look at these low concentration effects, but they still are not well regulated. So what can you do? Well, um, you can reduce your use of pharmaceuticals and personal care products when possible. So I emphasize that when possible, because I wanna make sure that people don't hear this talk and think that they need to stop taking all their medications. I am not at all saying that. You should take every medication that's prescribed to you. You should take it as prescribed by your doctor. Those medications are, uh, awesome. The pharmaceuticals and the development of various synthetic chemicals has really increased the, the longevity of humans as well as our quality of life. So it's really great that we have these great pharmaceuticals. But maybe you don't need to take all of those over-the-counter supplements that have sketchy scientific underpinnings. Maybe you don't need to use the antimicrobial hand soap and instead you could just use a natural hand soap product. So reduce your use of these pharmaceuticals and other synthetic chemicals when possible and when it makes sense. Properly dispose of unwanted medications. So you should 100% take your medications as prescribed by your doctor. If you don't, if for some reason you decide you don't need it or your doctor says you don't need it, then make sure you properly dispose of them. There's a variety of different ways to do this. Uh, Alachua County Hazardous Waste Collection Center collects unwanted medications. There's a wide range of take back programs often organized by the drug enforcement agencies. So uh, police stations and sheriff's offices will often take back unwanted medications. Pharmacies often will like CVS or Walgreens will often have unwanted medication drop boxes. Um, worst case scenario, if you can't get to one of these take back programs, you should dispose of your pharmaceuticals in your solid waste as recommended by the EPA. So uh, dump your medication in with some uh, coffee grounds or something else that's unpalatable, mix it up so nothing, no animal or no child will accidentally ingest it if they get into your trash. And then it gets taken to the landfill. It's not ideal, but it allows for a longer potential time period for those pharmaceuticals to be broken down by natural ecological processes. So to wrap things up, um, just to kind of uh, call back to our uh, long-term ad campaign, trying to raise awareness for the impact of drugs on our brains. I think it's also important to start to recognize the impacts of drugs on the environment. So this is your urban stream and this is your urban stream on drugs, but we still have a lot of questions. So I'm hoping that this uh, presentation was informative to you, um, probably raised more questions than answered, but this is something I'm working on and a lot of our colleagues are working on. And I think it's really important to get a better understanding of these issues. So here's my contact information. If you have any questions um, or if you have any issues, also Pushpa knows how to get into contact with me as well. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I'll maybe stop sharing my screen so that we can have more of a conversation if that's okay. Thank you, AJ. This was fascinating and very, very topical subject uh, that is, of course, all of us need to uh, need to be conscious of. And I must mention that you are getting national recognition because uh, I heard you your interview on NPR uh, Science Friday. So that was wonderful that you were representing University of Florida, but that you are here and you're doing this very important work that is being recognized nationally. So I do think that, that there is an increased um, awareness of this, uh, of the potential of having pharmaceuticals in the water and what we can do about it. Uh, 
I, I'm sure there are questions and uh, Paula, I see. there are some on, on the Zoom link. So Paula, you want to start off? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Pushpa. Uh, yes, uh, really uh, excellent lecture. Kind of frightening really for all of us to think about, but I, I was wondering if you knew whether in the uh, infrastructure bill being uh, considered by Congress, you know, if we have um, uh, any improvements to the uh, wastewater treatment facilities being considered. And uh, part two, I guess, of my question is, um, are there any innovative uh, technologies uh, being worked on to <clears throat> aid in, in the yeah. drug disposal yeah. that you're aware of? Yeah, yeah, those are good questions. Um, so I am not fully up to date on the current infrastructure bill, so I can't say with 100% certainty either way. So definitely don't quote me on this or take this as the correct answer. My best understanding of the infrastructure bill is that it's more focused on transportation, um, on roads and bridges. Um, I do think that there is funding for um, individual states to dole out based on their own priorities. And um, I know that the state of Florida has prioritized water quality as an infrastructure issue. Um, so I would imagine that there would be some funding. And I do think I do think that there is some proportion of the infrastructure bill the last I saw is targeted at wastewater upgrades, sewer line uh, repairs, that sort of thing. But it's definitely not the, I, it's, it's not a major portion of it, I would say. It's not the main thrust. Um, in terms of the technology question, <clears throat> I think that there are a range of different technologies that are currently being pursued. Um, and there's also some, some different technologies that are already being used. For example, one thing that's used pretty heavily here in the state of Florida isn't necessarily to get rid of synthetic chemicals, but it's to maybe reduce their environmental impact is actually reclaimed water. Reclaimed water is being used a lot. It's basically, it takes the treated wastewater effluent and instead of discharging it directly into a stream or a lake, it pumps it back out to communities and allows them to use it for irrigation water. So that might not sound like a benefit because it's like, oh, you're just putting these chemicals back on the land. But that require, allows more time for either physical breakdown of those chemicals or bacterial consumption, bacterial breakdown as well. Um, other technologies that I, I've heard about, I haven't worked a ton with, but I do know here at the University of Florida, there are engineers and microbiologists working on uh, biopolymers and biomembranes that are super selective on individual compounds or individual materials. I think that technology has a lot of potential, but from what I've seen, it's very much in the small lab-based scale at this point and will take a while to scale up. Um, I've also seen folks talking a little bit about using more classic proven technologies like activated charcoal or um, biochar or other things like that, that have a lot of potential to bind up these chemicals. But again, I think it's, I think that it's still not easy technologically. And in order for something to be adapted, it has to either be super easy and cheap or there has to be some push from, from somewhere. Um, so this isn't really a priority for many people at this point. Um, and so that's why we're doing a lot of this research to try to get it more of a priority. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. We have, we have a comment here from James Grantham. Uh, he wants to know about hormones, hormones mm -hmm. in the water. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I haven't actually done any work at this point looking at hormones. Um, but I will say that I actually have a project that we're currently doing funded by Alachua County Environmental <coughs> Protection Department, where we're trying to look at hormones leaching out of um, biosolids and, and composted materials to look at the environmental prevalence of hormones and other chemicals. Um, but so I, I know that they are out there. Um, I'm not sure. I, I can't really say one way or the other on their environmental impacts. Thank you. We do know of some earlier studies where hormones in the water change the sex of the fish. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah. yeah, the sex hormones that come from um, the pill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. The, in, the, in the urine and then going into the wastewater. Uh, yeah. We have a question from Rick Gold. Rick, 
know what if, I don't okay, know. Thank you so much. Uh, your data on comparing the concentration of uh, pharmaceutical and personal care products in different streams interested me because it seemed to indicate that there was really a difference uh, between streams of the mm -hmm. types of, of residue that was found. Yep. Uh, and th that, of course, uh, uh, is uh, important in some of the work that you're doing. But I also was wondering whether it, uh, the type of data could be used to determine where there might be overprescription of drugs mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. in any way overuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is this, this the, the figure that you were referring to, the data? I yeah. Think, I imagine, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. So this is from a study where we were trying to, yeah, we were trying to get at, get a little bit at use and overprescription um, or more just like population characteristics and how that related to pharmaceutical residues in the environment. Um, and it's, it's really difficult to, to answer those questions and to say with certainty how much of this is due to um, population demographics, prescriptions, seasonality, when we happen to be sampling, because these chemicals are at such low concentrations that what I'm not showing you here is that we had, so we had these seven sites and we sampled them weekly for a year. So that's seven times 50, so that's 370 or so potential sampling events. And about at least 50% of those, we found no no signature of any pharmaceutical because they're at, either they're at such low concentrations that we can't detect them or they're not there. And so it's really tricky to say how much of this is we just happen to be sampling on one day where there was a huge, like somebody dumped their analgesics down the drain and that was just a random event versus how much of it is more of a systemic problem or systemic issue. Um, I'll also say that again, I think I mentioned this, but if I didn't, all of these streams do not have any wastewater treatment plants draining into them. So this is direct, like this is uh, sewage infrastructure issues directly from for the study. And so we did that intentionally because it's pretty well known that wastewater treatment plants do exhibit high concentrations and they um, integrate a broader community um, that feeds into that wastewater treatment plant. So that would give you a more holistic idea of like the big picture, what's being overprescribed, underprescribed, overused, underused, that sort of thing. Um, but in this case, we were interested in some of the population demographics that we didn't really find as being significant drivers just because it was so seemingly seemingly random at times. Hopefully that, I mean, so long story short, I don't know the answer to your question and it's hard to, it's hard to figure out the answer to that question, but we're trying. Uh, there's a uh, comment in the in the chat section that your data on contamination is impressive, but how do these data support or contradict the progressive increase in life expectancy? Yeah, so the contaminant. So yeah, there. That's what I was kind of trying to get at near the end, where I said I'm not at all trying to tell anyone to stop taking their medications. Um, pharmaceuticals are, um, they're a lot, like quite literally a lifesaver and they're super important for human health. Um, they're super important for developing countries to have access to all these uh, save life-saving drugs and also not even just life-saving, but like life improving too. Like antidepressants are life-saving at times, but they also just enhance the quality of your life. Um, and so, the, the increased longevity is, um, I mean, there's a variety of different factors. I'm not a human health expert. Um, I would imagine that pharmaceutical advances have something to do with that. And I'm not, and I'm more with this presentation and this work trying to just raise awareness to the fact that this is an issue and these pharmaceuticals are one contaminant that we need to be concerned with among the wide range of other chemicals that are out there. I also study pesticides. I also study heavy metals. I study nitrogen and phosphorus. And it's, it's interesting to me when some things are like the main concern of everyone in the, in the newspapers and everything like that, like P 
PFAS are now all the rage in terms of contaminants of concern. And that's like, that makes sense. It's a major issue and they're forever chemicals. They don't go anywhere. But we seem to have glossed over some of these other things that are out there and are having these significant impacts. And I just don't want to ignore them. Oh, can't hear you. Ken? Yes, um, the, uh, I was just wondering, and maybe you already touched on this and I missed it, but have you looked at the effects of the sweet water mm -hmm. treat operation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a, a little bit. So we, I, I showed one study results of one study that we did in the Sweetwater Branch system um, that was looking at the effects of ciprofloxacin on uh, algal photosynthesis. And so for that study, we what we did is we put tiles out in Sweetwater Branch at multiple po points along Sweetwater. So the Duck Pond neighborhood, which is up in the headwaters, it's in a suburban community uh, down in downtown Gainesville, Main Street area. And, and then about 500 meters below the wastewater treatment plant uh, effluent discharge, and then another kilometer or so further down. And so we grew those algae in those different conditions, and then we brought them back to the lab and exposed them to Cipro over a two-week period. And after that two-week exposure, we measured photosynthesis, photosynthesis rates. And we found that the algae that was grown Immediate down, immediately downstream of the wastewater treatment plant was significant. Like there was no farm, no photosynthesis at all. It was 100% inhibited um, in response to the Cipro. So Cipro had a huge impact on that community. But then we also went out and actually collected samples uh, from the stream water. And again, this is kind of that randomness, low detection threshold, but none of our samples, even the ones at the site below the wastewater treatment plant had any detectable ciprofloxacin when we went and collected them. Um, that's not to say that there aren't any anti antibiotics or other chemicals uh, below that wastewater treatment plant, but we just didn't find it in that study. We haven't done any other work there at this point, um, largely because the fact that, like I talked about earlier, because there's not a lot of regulation of these discharges, there's also not a lot of funding for research or even for monitoring. Um, I've talked with GRU about this, and honestly, their answer, they're, they're, they're very in favor of uh, doing what they can to improve the environment. But at times, at least, it seems like they their answer is we'd rather not know. Um, <laughs> we don't have to. Like, I'm not, don't, don't quote me on that or anything. I guess I am being re recorded. So I... I that's not a direct quote from anybody, but that's kind of how it seems. But that's not just GRU, that's everybody. That's, um, that's I'm not gonna name any other agencies, but I don't blame them at all because that's just the world that we live in right now. Um, we do have monitoring, like continuous monitoring of water quality below, in Sweetwater Branch, below the wastewater plant, but we don't do pharmaceuticals regularly. We collect samples for nutrients and uh, temperature and pH and oxygen and other things like that. Um, so we do have work in that area, but not as much focused on pharmaceuticals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a comment here on the chat box. It says, are there brands of bottled water that contain significantly less drugs? Yeah, um, I, I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, it depends on the source of the water. Um, it depends on when it was collected. It could depend on the plastic that's being used to bottle the water. I'm not sure. I haven't looked into that, so I can't really speak to that. Okay. Um, I, I have a, okay, wait, there's another question here. Anne-Marie? Uh, yes, thank you, Pushpa. Um, um, I religiously take all my drugs that are um, to be disposed of over to Walgreens or wherever I can find a place to dispose of them. And I always wondered what happened to them. Uh, yeah. because I, always, I always assume that they end up in some landfill somewhere. And so I wonder if, um, if hydrochemists have an ongoing battle with soil agronomists regarding 
what the worst case scenario yeah. is between you two sets of scientists. That's one thing I, I wanted to ask. And the other is I am a political scientist by training. So of course I'm always gonna ask why the heck it is that we don't have um, lobbying efforts to get PPCP and others regulated because it seems to me that scientists uh, cries fall on deaf ears and that people don't understand the damage that this is doing to the environment. So it's kind of a scattershot uh, approach to reaching the public as far as I can see. I just wonder if you had any thoughts on either of those two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what happens with the drugs when they're collected? Um, depends largely on the compound, but a lot of them are actually incinerated at really high temperatures. And that breaks a lot of the chemical bonds and makes them, it leads to byproducts that are non-harmful. So I think that's the most common approach is they are incinerated and the ash is treated in certain ways. And I'm sure there's certain chemicals that can or can't be mixed together. I'm not exactly sure the specific has waste management on that end, but some of them probably are deposited in a landfill somewhere. Um, certain products probably are, but I can't say exactly 100%, but I think that the majority are incinerated um, or otherwise rendered inert. In terms of the political science question, um, I'm going to, I, I probably shouldn't have said what I said about GRU, and so I'm going to put my hat back on as an IFAS official uh, state employee and say that I cannot answer why there isn't more of a push for lobbying from this perspective. Um, if you run into me at a brewery or something, we can talk more about my specific personal opinions on that. But in general, I agree with you. But there's it's a complex issue. Right. And um, unfortunately, it's probably going to take some disaster to change people's minds. I, I have a similar question to Anne Marie's. You know, it is always recommended to us as individuals that when we need to dispose of drugs, to mix it up with coffee grounds mm -hmm. and then dispose of it. But that doesn't prevent it from going into the water system with all these different methods. No. So the mixing with coffee grounds is the reason behind that is to make it so that if uh, a dog or a raccoon or a kid even gets into your trash and like starts digging around in it, they don't accidentally consume something. So you mix it with coffee grounds because animals don't want to eat coffee. Um, and so that makes it unpalatable and because a drug, a pill might not kill us, but it might have a, like, you don't want your dog getting into your medicine cabinet for that same reason, right? Um, so that's why mixing it with coffee grounds. And then but yeah, if you take, if you think about what happens to your trash, it goes to a landfill. That's not preventing it from getting into the environment at all. You're hundred percent right. But even so, once something goes to the landfill, the ways that it can get into the environment, landfills are pretty well managed and maintained these days. Like they have to be lined. So they prevent things from leaching into the groundwater. They have to capture all of the runoff in, um, in treatment cells. Uh, I don't know hundred percent of the landfill process, but Basically, they try to keep things on site or limit what gets off site and how quickly that happens. So that allows for more physical, chemical, and biological breakdown of these chemicals. Um, a lot of pharmaceuticals are what we call pseudo persistent in the environment. And we call them pseudo persistent because any individual molecule won't last for that long. Like some are, some will photodegrade, some will be degraded by temperature, some will just become inactivated over time. Uh, some are consumed and transformed by bacteria, but most of them aren't like PFAS. They aren't forever chemicals, but the fact that they are being constantly discharged into the environment means that there's always some pharmaceutical in the environment. Even if the individual molecules are being broken down, the, the total concentration is more constant is, is the general idea. But basically taking longer for the chemicals to get to the water is, is our goal. We have one more question, uh, Bob. Bob, Bob Burns. Yes, 
AJ, thank you. Uh, I worked in the in River Lagoon system for my whole career. It's a saltwater body, but with long residence time. And I'm wondering whether the pharmaceuticals persist as long and have the same effects in saltwater as yeah. freshwater systems. Yeah, and I think you might have chatted that to me. So I was going to actually try to yeah. get back to you on that chat, but I didn't have the time. But um, my short answer is I don't know. Um, I would say, so I'm like, I consider myself a biogeochemist, which sounds super fancy, but it basically means I know enough biology, geology, and chemistry to get in trouble, but not enough of any of them to be a real expert, right? Um, and so the chemistry behind these compounds, I would imagine that the salinity would, would definitely interact with the chemical bonds of a lot of these pharmaceuticals. But I would also imagine that, it, so I bet it would affect some, I bet it wouldn't affect all. It might make some of them persist for longer. It might make some of them degrade more quickly. It might prevent some from absorbing to sediments and staying in the water or vice versa. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's an interesting question. And I've started working with some coastal ecologists to do some contaminant work. Um, we haven't gotten to the pharmaceutical side of the story yet, but that's an interesting thing to consider moving forward. Thank you. Uh, I have one final question. Mm -hmm. In terms of unintended consequences, do you think these pharmaceuticals could have some beneficial effects by being in the water? For example, re reducing the algae concentration, mm -hmm. yeah. by reducing photosynthesis, or mm -hmm. increasing the size of crayfish, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be like yeah. beneficial. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, um, back when I was first starting to do this, my mom had, she's moved now, but she used to have like a little bit of a koi pond in her backyard. And every summer it would get overgrown with algae. And she would always ask me, cause I'm the water quality expert. She's like, how do I get rid of all this algae? And one time I joked, oh, just dump a bunch of Benadryl in there. Cause that'll kill all the algae. Um, and so like, yeah, like I could see that point. Um, personally, I think that algae get a bad rap. Algae do a lot of good things for us a lot of the time. Um, they actually suck up nutrients and prevent further blooms downstream. Like you don't want an algal bloom, but you don't want to kill off all of the algae either because that would stop all the other processes. A lot of things eat algae, bugs and fish eat algae. Um, Algae suck up nitrogen to prevent a further downstream issue. Um, so, but like, yeah, I don't know. I can't see that being a benefit, but I don't necessarily, I don't, yeah, I don't know how to answer this. You get changes that aren't necessarily always a bad thing. I'll say that. I don't really want to say that anything's a good thing from this, but like changes in microbial communities, who knows what could happen with a, a new microbial evolution? Like you could get some super bug that ends up being really great at um, breaking down oil spills because they've been so stressed out by the, all these other chemical contaminants. Um, I could see something like that. Um, but from an environmental perspective, I think it's like, I, I, I would be a bad ecologist if I said that there was good things coming from uh, water quality contamination. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? In the Looks like Ken audience? might have another one. Uh, Ken, Ken Burns. Yeah, just uh, an observation. Of course, sometimes we purposely add things like fluoride to the water. That's presumed by most of us to be beneficial, not by everybody. Uh, and uh, I might point out that uh, uh, in El Paso, they have a very high level of lithium in their water. And uh, they have a very low uh, violence rate. Uh, whether that's associated or not has been suggested. Uh, but I think that there, there are unintended consequences. Yeah. In some cases, they may be positive. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that about lithium in El Paso. I'm going to look that up. That's, that's an interesting uh, um, Thank you. Um... If anybody else has questions, you can send them to me and I'll forward them to Dr. Reisinger. 
Uh, we are running over time, so I think we need to end it. Thank you very much, AJ, for your wonderful presentation. It was excellent. We really appreciate it. And I have an announcement for the uh, uh, for the series. Next week's uh, lecture that is uh, was scheduled by Desmond Schatz has been is postponed one week. So next Monday, we will not have a lecture in this series, but Dr. Schatz will speak the following Monday on October 25th. Please make a note of it. Thank you. And Julianne will send out a reminder on this also. Thank you all for attending. Bye. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is really cool. I'm really, I, I'm really glad to see that this is a program and it's really cool how actively engaged you all are. Really appreciate your it. participation.